I'm delighted to say uh, Irish professional fighter Caitlin Phelan is with us after uh, going 4-0 and last week uh, after her biggest fight in Germany at the welterweight division. Caitlin, good morning to you. How are you getting on? Hey guys, how are you? Yeah, good. Congratulations first off. Um, tell us a little bit about this bout last week because um, there was a bit of subterfuge on your side. You went dark in the build-up to it. Normally fighters like to hype things up, but you went completely, expunged all your records and videos from the internet and came out and punched the head off your opponent in five rounds. Yes, yeah, so pretty much we kind of had an inkling that the fight would come about and we were like, this is a really good opportunity. No one knows who I am at the moment. So I can take everything down and no one will be able to find me. So that's exactly what we've done. So we knew they were underestimating me for this fight because all they saw was a 3-0 record of professional and that was it. Whereas I have a massive amateur record and not many people know that. So it was a really good opportunity to actually be able to take everything down. So that's what we've done and it worked perfectly. <laughs> And what was on the line? So I fought for the WBC Youth World Title, the WBF World Title, and the WIBA World Title, and I brought them all home. Right. And are they are they belts? Are they proper actual belts? Yeah, yeah, they are. They're big belts. Yeah. I'm kind of surprised you're not wearing them at the moment. Kind of like just sitting there going, "Yeah, I'm going to take <laughs> a couple of months now, sit in the couch, watch some crappy Netflix, and I'm not taking these belts off." Yeah, no, I've, I've done that for the past few days, so I was kind of warned, Caitlin, put the bells down and let other people hold them, so. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what do you do now that uh, you're making a name and uh, you can't take all your previous records down or you can't take previous footage off the internet? Sorry? Uh, how do you handle the point now that uh, you can't do the subterfuge next time that everybody's going to know a little bit more about you? It's pretty exciting, to be honest, because everyone's going to know my name now. And I don't mind not being able to take things down. We got to experience that, and that was a great experience to do that. But like, like I said, people are going to know who I am, and I'm going to get bigger and better fights now because they know who I am. So it's a pretty cool experience. How did the last fight go? The last fight was it was unbelievable. It still hasn't really hit me yet. So we went over, like we were heading over to Germany, into her home gym, her home crowd. So like four Irish people in a gym full of Germans. It was pretty like daunting and but it was a great experience like they were all lovely in fairness but people didn't expect me to win this fight everyone was like oh she's going over into the lion's den and she's going to get bet whereas i knew deep down i'd win this fight and i had that feeling deep down because i've done all the hard work for it so that's when we knew that this was my time and we had to take this fight so you're actually going over to a gym in germany there's a number of other fighters there in her that is a, a good statement of how expectant they were of the victory, that they perhaps didn't take you as seriously as they should have. Yeah, exactly. Like, all they saw on, so BoxRec has the, all the fighters around the world and their records. All they saw on that was a 3-0 and amateur professional record. They didn't see anything amateur. All they saw was my opponent was the same as her last opponent, and that's all they looked at. Because if they'd done their bit of digging and they saw what my amateur record was, my experience, I don't think they would have taken that fight. And in terms of styles, actually, will you talk us through what your intention was heading into the fight? Because, uh, you know, just reading the reports, it seems like you controlled the, the five rounds and, and um, they threw the towel in at that point. So in the experience of the fight itself, did it go exactly as you planned? Were there differences? Was there something that she did that you didn't expect? So in training camp, we kind of hyped her up to be better than she is but we've done all the stats we've done her box like her amount of punches she throws in a round we literally done everything we could to figure out who she was how she fights and we realized that she doesn't do well under pressure and that was our plan going in because i'm a pressure fighter i like to fight i like being in close and we knew that she wouldn't handle that so that was our plan going into the fight and that's exactly what we've done and it planned out to literally what we said so myself and my coach said it'd be she quit going into round six, and that's exactly what happened. Like, I've interviewed before the fight, and that's what we said, and that's what happened. So we had that feeling. We knew that she wouldn't last the amount of rounds with my pressure, and that's exactly it. I knew from the first punch that I had it. And did you manage to find similar types of fighters to spar in the build-up? Oh, the line seems to have frozen there. Caitlin, can you hear us okay? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, okay. Sorry, Owen was just asking there about getting sparring partners in the build-up. Were, were you able to find sparring partners that you could mimic her style with? 
Yeah, so I had a good few sparring partners. I had a uh, professional, Siobhan O'Leary, which was similar to her style. I had a guy named Arius from the gym that I train in. And I was sparring a girl called Winnie McDonough. She's an amateur from Nielstown. And my sparring partners were absolutely perfect, knew exactly what to do. They were mimicking her and they were mimicking other styles as well. So in case she did change her style, we'd know what to do. So I had great sparring to lead up to the camp, which was unbelievable. And Kayla, what happens next? So you're quite anxious to get out and, and fight again. I see that there's um, a fight set up for Belfast. There's a date at least penciled in. Um, that's a defence, I presume, and uh, there must be mandatory defences. So how do you build on this and how do you keep going? What's progress for you now in the next 12 months? So it is mandatory within the next six months that I do fight her again for the belts. So that is signed into the contracts that I signed at the start. And it's just me waiting for them to say, we want this fight now or whenever. Like, I'm willing to fight anyone. I think I proved that by going to Germany into her hometown that I'll fight anyone no matter where. Because I just love fighting and I just love the actual sport. So we're just kind of waiting to sit down with my team now during the week and we'll have a plan of what's next and who's next. So it's just a waiting game, really. Who is in that team, Caitlin? How many coaches do you have? How many people do you work with? Yeah, so my coaches are my dad, Paddy Phelan, and Niall Barrett from Unit 3 in Nace. And I have a cut man, which is Mark Kennedy, and then my manager and promoter, which is Leonard Gunning and Stephen Sharp. Because your dad was a boxer as well, was he? Yeah, so my dad, uh, he was a coach and he was a boxer in a gym in Ryston. It's called Ryston and Newbridge. And my two brothers box as well, and that's how I got into it. How quickly do you realise that this thing is going to take off for you when you're starting? And be, I, I presume your your follow your brothers are older than you, aren't they? That you're following in their <laughs> footsteps. And how quickly do you realise that this thing is going to work out for you? It kind of just hit me overnight when I won that belt. So I was like, "Shit, this is actually going to work. Like this is my time. I'm going to prove everyone wrong." And like I've always been put down my whole life, and everyone keeps saying, "Oh, you can't do this. You can't do that." Whereas I'm stubborn and I was like, I can, I'm going to prove you wrong. So like being the youngest in my family and I've always grown up with my brother saying, oh, you're, you can't fight, you can't do this. And I guess I'm proving them wrong as well. So it's great. <laughs> <laughs> who, who else are the Danae Sayers? Because like, uh, sometimes you, you look at boxing gyms and they're quite positive environments. I presume that the negative energy is coming from outside of boxing. Am, am I right in saying that? Yeah. Yeah, so it was like growing up, I've always had people like picking on me, bullying me in, in school and stuff like that. Whereas the gym is kind of my safe place, where it's always that place I go to when things are going bad or when I don't feel great. It's always the gym that makes me feel better. And what is it about the gym then in, in those situations that make you feel better? And, and how does that channel some of the whatever you were going through earlier in your life into a, a positive energy? How great an outlet basically has that been for you? Like, as soon as you get into the, like, the gym I train in is called Unit 3 Health and Fitness in Nace. But as soon as you walk through the doors of the gym, it's just, it's that safe place. You always get that feeling of just positivity and happiness as soon as you go through. All the coaches are just genuine and they're there to help you and benefit you as well. But of course, punching things helps as well. So <laughs> that always helps. Caitlin, I'm, I'm amazed that anybody would um, would bully you in school. Like, you know, obviously you, you've told us you enjoy fighting. That, like, um, it's, uh, you know, it must have been a horrific experience. Yes, I was always a shy kid growing up. I always kind of kept to myself. And the one thing I did enjoy and love was my boxing. And that was my, my thing. Whereas as soon as I started to kind of succeed in the sport and people didn't like that, they decided, oh, we don't want to be friends with her. So that turns everyone else against me just because people can be very nasty and say nasty things. And that's exactly what they've done. And by the end of it, I just, I didn't have a love for anything. I just didn't want to do anything. I was sitting at home and I started to actually dislike boxing as well. So that's when I decided I'm going to turn professional and I'm going to prove everyone wrong. But I was, like I said, I was always a shy kid. So I'd never stick up for myself or I'd never actually say, oh, that's wrong, you can't do this, or I, I'd never punch someone outside the ring, so I knew that was wrong. So it was always get to the gym and take my frustrations out there. And uh, like, uh, while you're becoming a professional athlete, one of the other things that has to happen as well is your development as a, as a person. We keep hearing from various sports people that sometimes they become too focused on one thing. Are you getting that work-life balance right? I mean, it's very early on, obviously, but 
now is a good time to get those habits that are going to last you a lifetime. See, like I have a really, really good team around me and they make sure that I do have that balance between training, like life, everything like that. Like my, my job is my boxing and people are like, oh, you're a professional boxer. That must mean you're rich and you're loads of money. Where people don't see that, we don't. We depend on sponsors and things like that. But it's just getting that balance between everything. And I'm lucky to have my team to help me with that. How powerful a motivation is it to prove people wrong? To actually think to yourself, those people who picked on me earlier in life, I can prove them wrong by succeeding in this thing. It, the feeling you get is just unbelievable. Like you always have that little bit of a push and a little bit of motivation when you feel like things are going down or you don't have that motivation. If you just think back on what happened or what people say to you, that does give you a little bit of a bite and a little bit of a push to actually achieve something that you really want. So it's it does, like I wouldn't change what I went through or anything like that because it made me who I am today. And do you think that if you hadn't gone through that, you would have stuck to the amateur boxing? Do you think that your career would have gone in a different direction? Who knows? Like, I yeah. honestly don't know. I just, I'm glad things did work out how they did because I'm actually loving my sport and I'm loving training every day. I just have that passion and that fire back, whereas I did lose it. What about your division? How, how competitive a division is it? Because I saw Leonard Gunning talking about maybe you might go down a weight and, and fight at that level. What's, what's the best that you want to fight at? What weight do you want to fight at most? And what's the best in terms of um, high profile and, and where the big money fights might eventually be? See, I'd like to go down the weight as well. I think it's best if I do because so I fought at welterweight for this fight, which was 66 kilos. Whereas I made that very easily, so I know that I'd be able to go down a division or two divisions. Whereas there's more females at the lighter divisions than there is at the heavier ones, because there's not actually that many females out there as professional boxers. Like there's only five in Ireland at the moment, and I'm the youngest, and the second youngest is Katie Taylor. So it kind of says a lot with there's not that many professional females out there. But it's always there's big money fights out there. Like I got called out by a girl in America called Summer Lynn. And they wanted me to fight for November, whereas we're going to let that kind of linger on a little bit longer. And then that will become a bigger fight. And who knows, we could headline somewhere big as well with that fight. So it's just a kind of a waiting game. It's like playing chess. You need to make a move without them knowing. So Why aren't there many female professional fighters? What are the, the barriers in people's way? Not many females like the fact that you've no head guard or lighter gloves and like the training is a lot harder as well for professional you're kind of putting more of your health and online and not many people like the fact that it's a bigger risk getting into the ring every time you do whereas i like i like the fact that it is a risk and it is a challenge every time you do get into the ring so that's kind of my personality well listen congratulations it's an incredible story and i think you're still only 20 so there's a, a, a massive career ahead of you caitlin well done and thanks a million for joining us this morning cheers thanks a million guys